Thanks a lot. Uh, so I'm here to uh, talk about the Kubernetes computer community. So um, as we all know, uh, Kubernetes is a very important project uh, to Google and to a lot of other uh, folks in the open source community. Uh, so today I want to talk a little bit about the Kubernetes uh, project as a community project uh, and how uh, that's the community uh, project is run uh, and why that's successful uh, and how that contributes uh, back to the the, uh, the success of Kubernetes itself as a technology. So Kubernetes is a, uh, as we all know, is a container orchestration system. Uh, it's uh, essentially what we'd like to call a container-centric uh, infrastructure. So not just uh, deploying any different ty any type of application. This is focused directly on containers uh, and is uh, container-native from the very beginning. It's inspired by Google's own uh, um, experience deploying systems using container technology. Uh, Google has been doing uh, deploying containers uh, in, at Google uh, for about 10 years. So all applications at Google are deployed using containers, uh, everything from search to Gmail, uh, et cetera. Uh, so Kubernetes is also a really good project in the sense that we, we've had experience uh, building things like that for the last 10 years, and we want to uh, can bring that out into the open source community. Uh, it runs uh, pretty much anywhere, so it can run in cloud environments as well as on-premise on your own data centers. Uh, it was open source in 2014. Uh, and instead of keeping this project uh, just to Google, uh, we created the CNCF, which is the Cloud Native Computing Foundation, in order to host Kubernetes uh, and to uh, promote Kubernetes as a project in the open source uh, community. The velocity of Kubernetes is pretty astounding. So what we have here is a graph showing the number of commits to the project uh, and the, number, the releases. This is a little bit of a dated uh, graph. We have uh, huge velocity over the last uh, three years. But um, right now, with, uh, after we've released 1.6, uh, we're at well over 15 uh, or 50,000 commits. Uh, so we're uh, continuing on this trajectory, and we're continuing to like, get more and more uh, pro to uh, commits and uh, um, contributors. The community growth is, is quite large. So we can see that uh, the number of of active contributors to Kubernetes. Uh, this is a weekly graph, so like uh, week over week. I think that dip there is Christmas. Uh, but uh, we can see that even some people are, are, commi are committed to Kubernetes well enough that they're committing over their Christmas holiday. Uh, but we have well over 15,000 contribu 1,500 contributors uh, to the Kubernetes project itself. And uh, that spans over uh, 15 time zones, so that means that Pretty much any time zone that you happen to go to uh, would you know, have a Kubernetes contributor in it. Also uh, very important to the project is the, the composition of the community. If this was a 100% or a very largely uh, Google-driven project, then we don't th think that it would succeed as an open source project. Uh, it's a very important that we have other developers uh, contributing to the project, uh, and even contributing more than Google does. Uh, so we can see here that before uh, 1.0, that Google was about three-fourths of all of the commits to Kubernetes. Uh, but between 1.0 to 1.5, we actually have more commits uh, via other people uh, in the community. So we can say, uh, on aggregate even, uh, over 1.0 to 1.5, uh, Google is not the highest contributor. So we can say, uh, this actually even goes further nowadays, which, uh, where um, Google is actually not the con top contributor. It's actually individual contributors. Uh, so essentially, the long tail of individual developers that are contributing to Kubernetes is actually the largest group of contributors, uh, rather than any one single company. So what drives this kind of success? This is, uh, this is something that has been a core part of the Kubernetes uh, project from the very beginning, uh, that we do everything in the open. So everything at, in the Kubernetes project is done in the open. All the development is done in the open, all the design work, all of the uh, decisions for which new features to include is all done in the open. 
This is uh, something that we felt was very important for the success of the project. So we see this as a kind of like a very uh, large community that we need to grow and, and, to, uh, and to do that we need to be very engaged. So, within, uh, so we encourage users uh, to uh, develop uh, communities of their own in local areas uh, by creating meetup groups and sharing information with local developers. Uh, and to, as well as helping uh, not just users, but developers that want to build things on Kubernetes. Uh, there are now over 4,000 projects uh, based on Kubernetes, uh, so things that use the Kubernetes API to build on top of Kubernetes. Uh, these open source projects include things like, you know, like OpenShift and other, these other type of PaaS solutions, uh, as well as many other different types of projects. All of the projects that are, all of the pieces of Kubernetes are also open source. So things like the UI dashboards and things like that are all open source projects based on Kubernetes. And then where the users and the developers in the wider community uh, are not able to fill a particular need, we work with vendors and other companies to, in order to uh, essentially plug the holes in where uh, Kubernetes is weak. So things uh, like uh, providing support and providing uh, ways of develop, like starting new clusters easily, things like that can be uh, developed by vendors. So these are the types of this type of ecosystem of just not just users, uh, end users, but developers as well as vendors uh, creates this virtual cycle that allows us to develop, to grow the community, and create a much more robust and uh, good project. And this project, this community is made up of all of these companies that you see here and more. Uh, so companies like, uh, like not just Google, but you know, Fujitsu, Huawei, uh, Red Hat, uh, CoreOS, uh, many of these companies are contributing to Kubernetes uh, and working in the community, building projects around Kubernetes, building products around Kubernetes, building support. Uh, support systems and support uh, uh, solutions on top of Kubernetes, uh, and essentially building a, a much more robust and, and, uh, and stable community. But building an open source community comes with a lot of challenges, and there's a lot of costs to companies like Google uh, contributing to open source and uh, putting their, their uh, weight behind a particular project. Uh, so many of the things uh, that you can kind of imagine uh, are on here, but some are, are a little less obvious. So things like the fact that it's time consuming. It's very time consuming for developers in the project of, at Google to spend time supporting and uh, nurturing and uh, building the community around Kubernetes rather than just committing code, right? We think that it's important to grow the community as well as building code, so we actually uh, think that it's worth it to spend this time uh, cultivating uh, the community. It's also 24-7, so that means that even though many of the developers are, are based in the US, we still have uh, things going on around the world. And so and we need to have a more robust community in order to uh, allow that to continue on a 24-7 basis and have uh, local community resources within individual time zones. So <clears throat> another thing is that, that tools are very uh, difficult to deal with at a when you get to a large project. Uh, and these can be like a, a fairly large drag on the velocity, all of the things uh, that I've talked about above. Also, when you, when you start to build a project like this, many of the other um, companies and the, the members of the community uh, can feel that they don't really have to contribute and, and don't get anything out of uh, and basically get all of the benefits out of it. This is essentially the tragedy of the commons, uh, but um, building a, a very nurturing community and a community where it's easy to get started and to contribute uh, kind of helps with this and allows more people to, to uh, contribute. So how do you, f you know, address all these problems and how do you make a community like this work? Um, so, one of the most important things is inclusion. So inclusion means including as many different types of people uh, into the project as possible. Uh, we do this by uh, creating a, a, 
a safe place or a safe uh, community uh, where people can uh, do things and build, the uh, build communities uh, in a more constructive way. Uh, so this it means that we have uh, things like a code of conduct, uh, and uh, we make it clear that, that people should not be uh, in engaging in things like harassing behavior as part of the project, and that makes it much easier for, uh, for new people to join this pro the project. We also have cross-organizational teams. So within, uh, so the Kubernetes project includes many, many people who are working at companies that are uh, and uh, contributing to Kubernetes, as well as individual contributors. And so we need to have a way of communicating with all of these uh, different stakeholders uh, in different parts of, uh, that are working on different parts of Kubernetes. And so we have these cross-organizational teams, uh, and um, those are essentially uh, called special interest groups uh, that can be then uh, can focus on a particular area of Kubernetes. Uh, so that means that that makes it uh, easier to scale up Kubernetes, uh, where uh, developers can focus on the area of where they have the most expertise and the most knowledge, uh, and not get bogged down in the overall uh, churn of the project. Uh, next is transparency. So transparency is also a very huge part of developing an open source project. Uh, we elected to do everything in the open, uh, including de deciding which features to build uh, and which uh, um, and the, the and uh, doing the discussion of all the design of those features uh, out in the open uh, and this we think uh, can take takes a little bit more time to uh, to actually uh, break that down and come into uh, get a, a design worked for a, for a new feature uh, but by doing it transparently in the open, we end up getting better solutions. We come up with better, we get better ideas uh, included, even though it takes a little bit more time to get things, uh, get things decided. Uh, also, like, you know, ownership goes along with uh, these, these cross-organizational teams. So, like, these, the teams uh, each own different parts of Kubernetes. Um, and, uh, you know, learning together is also the, one of the most important parts of making things, doing things out in the open. Uh, many open source projects that are kind of backed by companies are done uh, in a way that they do the new feature development uh, or new feature, deciding which features to build uh, in a closed way, uh, and then just releasing the code. Uh, we don't think that this is uh, the right way of doing things. We think that people will learn much better uh, and uh, get much more out of the project by learning together, uh, collaborating together, uh, talking about the, the ideas, these ideas in the open, uh, and uh, developing, these, uh, developing the project and, and allowing it to uh, move in a direction that best fits the community's needs. So I mentioned special interest groups. Uh, this is an example of, of what those look like. So uh, special interest groups include many different companies, or, or folks from many different companies, uh, and as well as independent developers. Uh, many of them meet uh, weekly and have uh, over the, uh, the internet VC uh, meetings uh, to talk about the sort of uh, the new features and, and, uh, and hash out uh, what's going on recently and things like that. Um, and so two of these examples, one is cluster lifecycle. That's uh, essentially uh, talking about how to make Kubernetes easier to install uh, and focus on how to get a cluster up and running. Uh, and then the service catalog, which is another uh, uh, special interest group that is focused on developing the, the service broker. Uh, there was many other service in special interest groups. Uh, so not just cluster lifecycle and service catalog, we have apps. Uh, which is focused on how on deploying applications to Kubernetes. We have things like uh, on-prem, which is focused on on-premise workloads. Uh, we have things like Windows, uh, running cl containers on Windows, uh, as well as contributor experience. So even things that are not technologically oriented, but more how to make it easier for Kubernetes uh, developers to contribute to the project are also things like are, are also created as special interest groups which focus on that area and make the project a, a, a better, uh, make it a better project for, for new contributors. So this is a, a really key part to how to make the project scale to a larger size uh, and as, as well as keep it successful. 
So next, I want to talk a little bit about transparency. Uh, so the main thing that most people think about when they talk about when you think about transparency is the actual GitHub's, GitHub issues and and proposals, as well as the commits for the code. Uh, but it's not really just about that. It's uh, a, a whole range of things. Uh, we found that just creating an open source project and and sending out the codes and keeping the inf the issues open is not the the uh, not sufficient uh, to having a good transparent project. Uh, so we uh, added things like these SIG meetings, so these community meetings, uh, burn down meetings for, for projects to, uh, to kind of assess uh, how well the project went. Uh, things like uh, developing a new roadmap process. Uh, so we used, we started building a way to uh, discuss which features that we wanted to add to the project uh, in the future. Not just creating GitHub issues, but creating, we created a whole new separate repository with, uh, with feature issues uh, that people can talk about and, and comment on. And then the next release, uh, when the next release comes around, uh, we can figure out exactly which features we want to have in these next, the next release so that we know where the developers can focus uh, their attention. So, all, doing all of these things in the open is important to the project so that everybody knows how things are decided, knows how, what things are going on, knows how to, uh, how to contribute, where things are, where things are being decided, uh, things like that. So <clears throat> I talked a little bit about the roadmap. Uh, so uh, we have like a, a semi-annual kind of unconference with uh, SIG groups to kind of figure out uh, things like uh, the themes and priorities, uh, and have a kind of a top-down plan. Uh, and this gets kind of done uh, at the start of each release. So we have this, the features repo, as I mentioned, uh, and at the start of each release, that gets populated with uh, the features that, that folks want to uh, include in the release. Uh, and then that's basically frozen about two weeks before, uh, two weeks into the, uh, into the development of that release. Uh, so that each and then each uh, and each issue is required to get SIG approval. So uh, for um, uh, for the launch label to add it uh, to the to the launch. Uh, so this serves as a kind of like public uh, way, a public uh, place to look and see at the f the new features that are being added to the uh, to Kubernetes and and see the design and how it's working. Uh, it's being fleshed out. So it has also added, helped to add uh, improvement to, uh, to documentation and blog coverage, which is like really important to, uh, uh, but uh, challenging in open source. We know when we create a new project or we create a new release, we know exactly which features need attention in the documentation uh, and um, how to best explain those in the f uh, to, uh, to the developers. So lastly, we like we have uh, well. So next, we have uh, ownership. So ownership is essentially how to kind of progress uh, in the project. So you start as a contributor. Uh, so contributors are actually programmers. Uh, so and then we have uh, product managers, which work at individual companies uh, and try to uh, influence how uh, what sort of features are uh, added to Kubernetes and help. Um, to integrate with their with the individual companies as well as uh, SIG leaders and uh, release managers, and each of these kind of open, own like different parts of the of the project, right? So SIG leaders kind of help coordinate a SIG, and the uh, release managers actually do releases, and contributors uh, actually write the code. So each of these can kind of work on their specific area and uh, don't have to worry about all of the other things going on. And individual contributors can also like kind of rank up in, in their uh, involvement with the project uh, and grow in responsibility. So just being a, a de developer that adds uh, code to the project as a member, uh, you can then become a reviewer to review other patches uh, to the project. Uh, eventually, you can become an approver, uh, somebody who can approve PRs to the to the uh, to the project, and then finally, an owner of a particular area of the project. So finally, like we, when I uh, talked about like that we learned together, one of these things like we talked about burn down meetings and we talked about other uh, different types of meetings that we can have, uh, like 
we definitely uh, don't know like everything about how to run a project, but we know that these types of uh, doing these meetings uh, very often uh, and and kind of evaluating how things have run in the past and how things are, are doing, uh, how, thing, how we can improve things in the future has really helped us uh, to evolve the project. So here's some user feedback on the project. So not just from end user and developers, but also like you know companies uh, that are that feel that not just the technology, but the fact that the open source project is so, itself is so successful uh, lends gives them uh, confidence uh, in how to uh, move to the in the future. So uh, I'm so we've seen that like from user feedback that that import. Open source is very important. Over, over half are very important or critical. And that these types of projects, the fact that they, are, they are, have a good community that's easy to get involved in and, uh, and is able to um, be scaled properly is very important to the actual success of the project and whether uh, uh, users and companies adopt it. So here's some kind of sample talks from, from Kubhan, sorry, uh, and uh, that you can kind of check out. Uh, but um, I just want to like close by saying that, uh, that it's very easy to join the Kubernetes project. Uh, just go to GitHub uh, slash Kubernetes and check it out, uh, as well as uh, you know, join the, the Slack channel. Uh, so uh, from the Kubernetes website, there's a Slack link. Uh, and you can check that out uh, in order how to get more involved with the special interest groups and the wider community. Uh, thank you very much. <laughs>